Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome to the Indian Boxer Ring. Um, Indian Boxer Ring uh, today has uh, brought uh, two guests uh, under the topic two continents and one goal. Um, for the benefit of those folks that are watching this uh, event now or later, uh, here's a brief introduction about the panelists that we have today. Uh, we have Dan Bookwald. Uh, Dan Bookwald uh, is uh, originally from Brazil and uh, has been closely associated with the boxer breed for many, many years. Now, since moving to America uh, over 20 years back, Dan has uh, pursued a successful career as a professional handler. And uh, though he has retired from active uh, breeding of boxes, Dan takes pride in mentoring people. And he also takes pride in being the breeder of the first ever boxer to go winner's pitch and best of winners uh, from the bred by exhibitor class at the ABC National. Uh, Marcello, on the other hand, is from Italy. He has been actively involved with the breed. Um, again, um, in various capacities, uh, he is an official, of, uh, official delegate of the ENCI, otherwise known as the Italian Kennel Club. Um, he is also an ENCI trainer and a handler. He's a regular at the At The Box shows. Um, you could see Marcello, if you don't forget to say hi, he's there. Uh, and uh, he also breeds boxers under the prefix Boxerita Kennel. Uh, now, both Dan and Marcello uh, grew up in, in a household with boxers, having been born into families uh, that bred and showed dogs. Uh, they also have veterinary backgrounds and have a thorough and in-depth understanding of both form and function. Now, they also wear multiple hats, uh, or they have worn multiple hats, and in wearing those multiple hats, they're able to view dogs in the eyes of a breeder, a handler, and a judge. Now, both of, both of them have also done a lot of knowledge transfer sessions, breed seminars, uh, where they have discussed uh, the intricacies of the breed. And so it is with, uh, without any further ado, I just want to introduce Dan and Marcello. And I want to actually say it's a, it's a honor uh, to host this panel discussion, uh, to exchange the viewpoints of these two uh, legends, uh, in my eyes, Dan Bookwald and Marcello Marino. Good day, gentlemen. How are you doing? Hey, how are you? Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. Hello to everybody. Thank you again to be here another time. It's a pleasure. Wonderful. Uh, so, gentlemen, I do have some questions for you. And, uh, well, I don't want to just be the one asking questions. I also want those folks that would be tuning in uh, to post your question under the comments so I can actually, in turn, ask you these questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, before we start this uh, discussion, uh, what I want to actually uh, get from you, Dan and Marcello, is what did you, uh, what is your ideal blueprint of the boxer? Please don't. Should I start? Yes. All right. Um, I, I just want to uh, mention a uh, very famous late judge uh, in the United States. Her name was Michelle Billings. And she used to say that the way to judge dogs is to judge by templates. That means you develop a mental image of what's ideal and you compare uh, all the dogs you're judging and evaluating to that mental template. Uh, to me, uh, the ideal boxer is a medium-sized square dog, uh, a dog that uh, basically possesses uh, what I would say three squares, square body, square angles, and a square muzzle. Once you get those three squares, you're way ahead of the curve. Uh, very important for the breed is temperament. It's a self-assured, uh, not aggressive for no reason or shy uh, and submissive for no reason. It's a balanced minded dog, a dog that's fit for work, a dog that's fit for family, uh, a multi-purpose dog. And um, that's pretty much uh, the first impression, the first accession uh, I, I would do of uh, the breed. Thank you. So my ideal boxer, um, it's uh, it's a compromise. Uh, I just uh, follow uh, since the first time uh, one rule that uh, teach us uh, Frau Stockman uh, in the in the in the beginning. 
she teach us uh, that uh, the boxer is always a result of compromise. So uh, for me, it's the first rule. I have my uh, ideal uh, about the model, about uh, uh, what I'm looking for, but uh, always uh, uh, following this rule. The boxer is always a compromise in everything. So uh, I don't, uh, I, I try to um, think uh, balanced in, in my ideal uh, boxer. No, uh, um, for just for one thing, but uh, to be equilibrated in everything. So this is my idea of, uh, of boxer. Wonderful. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, now I want to actually, um, you know, I want to actually take this opportunity to get your perspective of the breed, and it would only be fair for us to start with the origin of the breed. Um, boxes uh, having originated from Germany, um, you know, spread to the other parts of the world. So the boxer started with this man-made breed. Uh, started with uh, the vision of what uh, the boxer was going to evolve into or it actually had the template or the standard for the boxer, which evolved later. So boxers went to different countries, different continents, boxers have uh, evolved, and they have evolved um, quite drastically in, so to say, because they're the present day boxer, which is a European boxer, and an American boxer are two different styles altogether. They all came from one standard, but they are two different styles. But I, I want to, before I get into that stage uh, of, the evolution. Uh, what I want to actually also look at, I want to look at the stage from uh, the gold, the period that is called as a golden period, the period from the 50s, uh, I would say to the 80s, some people say 50s to the 90s, during which there was a very minimum deviation between the styles of the breed between the European dogs uh, and the American dogs. Uh, now, my question to you both is uh, the 50s to the 80s, the period which had the minimum deviation is also the period considered to be the golden period for the breed. You know, there were some really great dogs that ruled the ring. There were some very strong influences for the breed. So if you agree with me that the 50s to the 80s was the golden period for the breed, why do you think this was a period of significance for the breed? You, you want start? to start? I can start? Yep. Okay, I, I almost agree about this consideration because uh, I think uh, that in this uh, range of time was uh, uh, one uh, continuous evolution of the breed, was very constant, the evolution of the breed, and uh, uh, till uh, um, 80 years or also 90 years. Uh, but we can stop at eight years. So we we get a, a very high level after one evolution time, and uh, I think it's the best time for the boxer because of this, because it was evolution time in, in the boxer. So um, I think that was the most important time for period for this, because it was evolution time. And after... Uh, uh, like we say all the time, uh, to preserve the level is the difficult. So I agree with you. All right. Uh, this is how I would look at it. Uh, first, we have to always, uh, when you talk about the evolution of a breed, you have to contextualize it. You have to put it in a time and space where things were going, all the other things that were going on. Remember that the World War II ended in 1945. Uh, Germany was uh, before World War I, actually, that's where the breed was developing. And then Europe got uh, uh, into two world wars that really devastated their economy. And uh, come the 50s, late 40s, early 50s, um, that precious gene pool of, of boxers that were developed in Germany, uh, the sale of one of those dogs will be the equivalent for many, many months of salaries of incomes uh, uh, for uh, breeders in that country. Um, this was the time where many uh, Americans uh, had the chance to go to Germany and purchase uh, the foundation stock that developed the breed in, in this country. Um, 
if you look at the the those decades uh again what's happening in that time and that space uh, uh and that place is that we were able to have breeders that were able to keep big uh, numbers of dogs their their gene pool was wide and and big because having a kennel with 50 dogs was not a big deal um this is no longer uh, a reality there are many factors that at this time will not allow this to happen uh when uh when you have a a, a gene pool that big and when you have breeders that are true visionaries people that studied and understood what this breed was all about uh they were able to produce the foundation that um lasted for decades uh the success of boxers in the 70s in this country is a direct co direct consequence of the hard work and and the strength of the gene pool from breeders uh from the 50s remember we imported four top producing boxers from germany <laughs> Oh my dogs go crazy, huh? <laughs> so they were able to to bring those dogs uh, to America, develop this uh, fantastic gene pool that um, um, endured for for decades, and that's the backbone, in my interpretation, of the golden years of this breed in in America. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, now. I want to actually move to this, uh, move this to the point of uh, evolution, right? Um, and I say we got to a point where there was minimum deviation between the American and the European styles. Now, there was a point when this deviation started. Um, well, the American dogs started looking very different from the European dog in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the variations that they they were that they had. Uh, I want to get your perspective on uh, at you know why this this style divide happened. You know what was the thought process behind the style divide, and what, according to you, would be the catalyst for this deviation? I start. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think uh, um, till. Uh, 80 years uh, we was uh, almost uh, at the same level very similar i think uh, mm, after uh, after this period uh, we start uh, the deviation uh, from the from the model and now it's very 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 evident but i think uh, uh, 70 80 years uh, more to 80 years was the point of the uh, important deviation of the models. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, probably there are a lot of reason for this, but uh, just just one that uh, I uh, I can mention, I want to mention, is that uh, in in Europe, uh, in Europe uh, was uh, this uh, uh, we say uh, rule no white rule no white. Uh, that uh, uh, the the boxer is a very elastic breed that uh, where there is a big range uh, in the in all choice and probably uh, a lot of breeder uh, have uh, misunderstanding this uh, this idea that uh, to have too much uh, uh, elasticity in the, in the breeding in the, too much range in the breeding in in all breed um, uh, can, uh, um, and uh, provoke uh, that people lost the way. This is my idea. So people misunderstanding the, the idea that the boxer had uh, open range in uh, in the standard in the model. This is my opinion. Okay, um, I will say this. Um, I believe, and I, I strongly believe, and uh, um, when you look at what was originally designed for the breed to be when you look at the original standard and most importantly when you look at the munich silhouette i believe that the american breeders although american dogs in general are known to be always streamlined modernized and and stylized and whatever uh in this particular breed american breeders did an excellent job in preserving the original breed type you can look at the munich silhouette 
from 1905, if I'm not wrong, and look at the profile of many of the top winners of today, and we are far more true to that than, than Europe. Uh, I would uh, say without meaning no insult that the Euro European boxer derailed into something totally different than what the breed was meant to be, where American breeders were better at preserving. If you look at um, in the early 50s when Frau Stockman came to America and judged that puppy match and she found Bangaway, she said, this is what I was striving to get. That style, even though we change details of, of uh, uh, confirmation here and there, but the overall style of that dog is something that been to a great extent preserved in America and derailed from in Europe. Um, if we look at us uh, breeders uh, as um, preservationists, if we are here to understand the standard, understand form and function, where the breed came from, what it was supposed to do, and how it was supposed to look to do what it used to do, I believe that we are doing a better job in America in preserving breed type than currently in, in Europe. Again, I mean no disrespect. This is my perspective. No, I I, I agree about uh, probably probably going into the discussion. We will touch this argument uh, uh, more time. But uh, uh, I agree about this. Uh, people, uh, European people, hate me when I say that uh, European boxer lost the way. So this is my opinion. So, All right. Um, so, gentlemen, I want to actually um, get deeper into this discussion about the evolution. Uh, <clears throat> now, look at two things. Dan, you mentioned about the uh, the form and function, uh, yeah. which are very important variables, form and function. I feel, um, and again, this is just an uh, object. Uh, this is just a subjective view of uh, the evolution here. I feel that the Americans, uh, the boxes in America, uh, focused on form whereas the boxes in Europe focus more on function. And I'll tell you why I, why I make that statement. Uh, a boxer in the way that boxes are uh, qualified, or the boxes are awarded winners, or the, the way they become uh, recognized as winners is when they, you know, the, when, they are, when they have form, you know, they, they have the ultimate form to the breed. Uh, and it, that's how it is recognized. It's not too much of a uh, function that they have for selecting the winners. Uh, whereas in Europe, it is more of a function that is being tested. Like for example, they have the working title and they have the beauty title as well, which is how the dogs are selected. This is how the breeding stock is chosen. So uh, do you think in your view that there is an unequal importance that has been placed on one variable versus the other, form versus the function? I will have to disagree with the premise of your question. To some extent, form is the consequence of function. Uh, I think that what you're referring to, Schutzman trials, working dog trials, and things like that, is uh, maybe, uh, um, maybe a trap where you can, un being unaware of what you're doing, deviate from uh, shape and favor performance, whether it's a, a Schutzhund dog or a working dog or all this working uh, um, evaluations. Uh, the, the way the standard is described, there's no way to favor form if the form wasn't defined by its function. So I would say that the American boxer, as far as the body built, and to some extent the mental uh, uh, belt is totally able to perform uh, as a guard dog. Um, I do think that American uh, breeders are greatly overlooking balanced temperament and we can address that uh, in, 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 a, in a little bit. But for, the, 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 for answering your question, no, I think that form and function will always walk hand in hand. Uh, do not conf uh, confuse uh, uh, form, um, actually do not confuse performance with um, 
overlooking uh, the shape, the form. That's the very definition of breed type. The very first parameter, if you if you go to say Rick Beauchamp's book, uh, Solving the Mysteries of Breed Type, the very first uh, description of, of what breed type is, is the silhouette of the dog, the, 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 the total make and shape, the balance of the parts and all that. A dog that's built right and, and that's equipped with a proper mind should be able uh, to do its job as a guard dog, as a family dog. We don't do dog fighting anymore. We don't do bull baiting anymore, thank God. But uh, that's where the origins of the breed came from. And that little bit of history is what we are preserving. So um, I do think that uh, we can do a whole lot of uh, working trials and Schutzhund and, and what have you with an American boxer with the one exception that temperament needs to be addressed in in the uh, American breeder for by American breeders at large. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Dan. So uh, I agree that uh, form and function function are connected. We can't uh, we can't talk about one without consider the other one. Uh, I want to uh, say uh, describe the situation about Italy. Um, because in Europe uh, there is the problem that every country make uh, have a diff different politic about uh, uh, the test, and in some country, some country are uh, considered by the breeding test, and uh, in Italy, uh, most of the time they consider like sport test, and this is a big difference. So if uh, we must consider one test like breeding test is one thing. If we must consider the test like sport test is another another big problem because not always the sport request are on the right way for the breeding test. So sometime when the, when we are looking for form and function, we we have some mistake because the the function are not balanced for the breed this is our problem in the last uh, uh, fci rule uh, they they say that uh, a competition judge must consider the difference of the breed but not always happen in this so uh, is a, it's difficult the situation now because <laughs> I think personally, and many other breeders start to think the same, that the tests that we have today are not very uh, good for the boxer because uh, are too much uh, uh, oriented by the sport than the breeding uh, evolution. So this is, this is our problem, not mm, the form and function, but the test of the function. This is our problem in, in Europe, I think. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Uh, now, I, I remember um, Dan and Marcello when we had a conversation earlier. Uh, now, I think, I think Dan, I think it was you that mentioned about um, one of the comments that you heard in an interview about uh, judges, uh, about judges and how judges have evolved uh, or how judging has evolved over the years. Now, my context with that particular setting is um, the breeds have seen uh, exaggerations over a period of time. And that's, I, I think, is a major cause for the deviation or the evolution of the breed. Uh, you know, I just want to state an example. A, dog, a boxer, even though the standard st states the height the range, there's no disqualification for the height. We've seen exaggerations in the height, which for boxers almost reaching out to 28 or 29 inches in height. Uh, we've also seen... Um, We've also seen the head proportions, exaggerations in the head proportions. You know, the standard states this is the proportion, but head proportions have changed. Uh, now, is this a case of uh, a hypertype, a hypertype meaning an exaggerated animal, which was actually chosen um, because the judges evolved in how they judged boxes. They picked this dog, and due to the popular sire syndrome or the flavor of the month, which is a is a bane for the breed. The breed evolved, and they, and that's how the breed evolved. And these are the dogs that evolved. And and what is your take on that one? About the evolution of the breed and the hypertypes influence on the evolution of the breed. We'll start. Go ahead. Okay, I can start. 
Okay, like uh, like uh, I said in the last interview, uh, I think uh, uh, the problem uh, about uh, I, I talking about European uh, situation start uh, 30 years ago in 90 years when uh, uh, some judge uh, um, start to uh, mention uh, the the side of the of the of the muzzle, the measure of the muzzle, no. Uh, and uh, they start uh, to say in the in the show, ah, this dog have no, have no muzzle, but uh, they no explain why the dog had no the, 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 the muzzle, no the muzzle. Uh, they don't consider the um, the bite that uh, must be wild, no. They uh, just uh, uh, put a, a, a sentence. Uh, this dog have no muzzle and uh, mm, the breeder uh, as consequence they start to breeding with uh, more short nose or have more uh, more muzzle to have more big muzzle without consider that uh, the, the, the the muzzle is by the bones from the teeth it's not from the skin and the short nose and uh, uh, these uh, make uh, a, a, a lot of problem in the boxer in Europe because like a consequence, uh, we had short nose, short head, round head, a lot of skin, a lot of problem consequence of bulldog type. So I consider the hyper type the dead of the boxer. Absolutely, is the if uh, we don't stop in Europe, this uh, the, the boxer uh, will die. The, the boxer that uh, we we know before the original uh, German silhouette, uh, like uh, we said before. So this is uh, uh, from what uh, the European problem is coming. From the judge from uh, 90 years that start with this consideration. Because in the in this time, they had a lot of beautiful boxer and for make the classification, for make the winner, they had to selection, but they selection in, in the wrong way. So this is for me is the problem. This is uh, one my uh, war in this period uh, with other breeder with the club. Uh, we must uh, follow, find, uh, follow the, the 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 right proportion and the large teeth, the wild teeth. This is my opinion. Uh, uh, this question of hypertype. Let me tell you a little story. Um, a friend of mine, many many years ago. He used to work for Volkswagen and he was trying to develop a windshield wiper that would not just get rid of the, the rain uh, on the uh, windshield, but also heat and do all kinds of other things. And it was this wonderful idea, except that every time you turn on the windshield wiper on really fast, it would fly right out of the base and it didn't work. And he said it was over engineered. And I remember that and I'm thinking over engineer, that's the exact same parallel I do with hypertype. The word hypertype for me is a euphemism. It's a way of saying we did something really, really wrong, but we're going to wrap it in this beautiful word that makes it look like we made it even better. We got something and we improved upon. We had type, now we have hypertype. Um, Another parallel, if you're not talking about type, if we're talking about anesthesia, if you use not enough anesthesia on a surgery, that would be very, very painful. If you use too much anesthesia, your patient will die. So type is the same thing. Hypertype is a label for the death of breed type. There is no such thing as hypertype. There is one breed, one type. Our job is not to invent, reinvent it, change it. Our job is to preserve it. So when I see these dogs that to me, from Europe, with no nose, with the, the profile that would be one uh, muzzle being one and the back skull being three, as opposed to what is supposed to be one to two, when you shorten the muzzle so much, to me, that's an aberration. The breed was never meant to look that way whatever they're doing for whatever reason they're doing it's incorrect 
because we are not reinventing the breed, we are preserving the breed. The Munich silhouette will not change because somebody decided they don't like it. If you don't like the Munich silhouette, if you don't like the way a boxer look, go breed French Bulldogs, but do not change the breed. So hypertype for me is a euphemism, but in, in reality is an insult, not to me personally, but it's an insult to breed type. So to use a term to, to blanket this uh, severe deviation from breed type is just outrageous. Totally. Thank you. I, I think I think both of you are in perfect agreement. I think I think we've we've been that way so far. And I uh, and uh, while I invite, uh, well, I, I think I have a few questions that I feel, having had an opportunity to interview both of you earlier. I think the I have some questions that you kind of differentiate, and <clears throat> I would love to hear those perspectives. But before I do that, I do want to actually put up a question from one of the viewers sure. uh, on the screen, and. So the question is, so when it said a uh, wide bite, is mm. that a widened bite, which would make the whole muzzle wider to accommodate the wider bite or wide in actual proportion to the skull? It's a very subjective term. Um, perhaps could this be where some kind of head modification came from in the European style? Huh. Um, subjective. Uh, uh... I don't think so much subjective. I, I would say relative. I mean that uh, the, the wild bite must be relative to the head. If we have big and round head uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, narrow teeth, it's very bad situation. Um, usually, usually um, uh, we, we must try to have correct head with more wild teeth possible um, it's uh, relative to the head of the of the dog of course if we have one very narrow head the the bite the the, the teeth uh, it's not possible that are um, totally large uh, too much large because the head have one proportion that uh, must be respected of course, uh, if uh, more the, the, the head is big, that is no good for the boxer, but more the head is the big, more um, teeth must be large, of course. So it's relative than subjective, I think. But uh, anyway, the muzzle is uh, uh, made by the bones and not the skin. When uh, um, German, uh, old German judge teach us to touch and feel the, the muzzle, they teach us to um, touch with the, the finger, the, um, the profile of the muzzle, um, touch the, the consistency, it's right in English, yeah, I don't know, the, um, the bones, to, 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 teach the, to teach and feel the bones of the muzzle and not just look at the, the muzzle for the, uh, with the skin. So I think uh, uh, this is but uh, I want to uh, uh, hear opinion of Dan. Um, I would uh, contextualize the question, put it in the context of the standard. What the standard says, the American standard says, and I believe the German standard at some point used to describe it the same way. Uh, boxers are supposed to have a square muzzle. That means length, width, and depth are about the same. Um, mm -hmm. The standard says that to reach that square muzzle, which is paramount for breed type, you have to have three parameters. The formation of the jawbone, the placement of the teeth, and the texture of the lips, the padding of the lips. So if you look at a dog and you have the square muzzle, which means there's a certain uh, proportion to, to, to that area of the head, uh, chances are, uh, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, you need to check the bite. You need to see how undershot that bite is, how wide the under 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 jaw is, but always in context. Do you have at the end of the day, do you have a square muzzle? Uh, if you do, uh, I guess uh, um, we are good to go. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for that question. 
Uh, and again, for those ones watching in, uh, please feel free to ask your questions and uh, I will put it in front of Dan and uh, Marcello. Uh, now, I wanna actually discuss the topic of the head because I feel that's where the, the major style deviation lies. Uh, now, on the topic of the head, and I have a few questions on this uh, on this particular uh, body part, on the head. Um, I want to actually talk. I want to actually ask you this question uh, about the eyes, the shape of the eyes. Uh, now, the shape of the eyes um, is uh, is actually interpreted based on what the standard says. Uh, in interpreted to be of different sh shapes, like it, some is interpreted to be that of an almond. Um, some interpret that to be a shape of a lemon. Uh, some interpret that to be uh, a circular in shape. Uh, yes, now, you gentlemen clearly interpret this differently. So my next question uh, is, what is your thought process behind your interpreting the eye to be of a particular shape? Um, when uh, um... When uh, um, people uh, uh, speak about expression of the boxer, sometimes they, they they consider just the, the shape of the eyes. Uh, I think uh, that when we are talking about expression of the boxer, it's just no sh shape of the eyes, but it's the uh, full characteristic of the face of the boxer. It's not correct to speak about the face, but in uh, slang we speak about face no and uh, um, i think uh, uh, it's uh, difficult it's difficult to uh, say to the uh, american breeder that uh, um, it's not right uh, the uh, um, uh, shape of the eyes uh, must be like lemon but in the other way is uh, no uh, right to say uh, to European breeder that uh, to say ah the box the height of the boxer must be not so open uh, and so round like you have in Europe. So I think uh, uh, from both side they are just a little bit far than original uh, idea of the boxer. This is my this is my opinion. Uh, from America and from Europe uh, they both are just a little bit far about. Uh, uh, the shape of the eyes. The, the the American type is too much like lemon, and the two uh, European type are too much big and too much open. I think the the, the compromise, the right the right model is in the compromise in the middle. I think in uh, this situation. So this is my opinion. Well, um, you got to remember that the shape of the eye it's not something that happens uh, out of context. Uh, uh, the placement of the eye, the length of the head, uh, that has a lot to do with the shape that, that you finally will, will obtain. If you look at a borzoi, if you look at a collie, uh, elongated head, uh, very uh, little stop. The eyes, when you elongate the head, the eyes tend to play, be placed more laterally. Yeah. As the head gets elongated, the shape of the eye equally gets elongated. So the Collie standard calls for a triangular eye. The Doberman standard calls for an almond-shaped eye. As you start to shorten the head, the shorter the head, the more frontal the placement of the eye. If you get to an extreme where there's almost no muzzle whatsoever, like a Pekingese, you're going to have a frontal placement of the eye and totally circular. So the fact of the matter is that boxers sit somewhere in the middle. They are not as pushed in as a, a pug or a Pekingese, and they're certainly not as elongated as a Doberman. So um, what happened with the American standard is that the standard says the eyes shouldn't be set too deep or shouldn't be too bulgy, or we know what it's not, but the standard is not supposed to tell you what the breed is not. The, box, the standard is supposed to tell you what the breed is supposed to be. It's a description of what it is. Our standard in, in America for generations, for decades, has been really, really shy in addressing it. Um, I did not coin the, the, the term uh, lemon-shaped eye. This was uh, done uh, in Australia by Judy Horton. And I think it's, it's the right description to, to what we have. 
uh, I would just like to add, well, I say that because obviously it's not a, a stretched uh, shape eye like an almond or triangular, and it's not circular, it's a compromise. <clears throat> what I would say is that uh, with the right proportion of muzzle to, to head, with the right amount of skin, uh, uh, the proper eye will have the lower rims tight and, and uh, not allow for droopiness. When you start pushing them too much in a breed like boxes where you have all the skin folds, you get too much jaw, you also get the ectropium, that little wrinkle on the bottom of the eyelid, on the bottom eyelid that is uh, functionally incorrect and, and is not a healthy thing to have. Yes, I agree because he, like uh, you exactly said, it's a consequence of the type, of course. It's the consequence of the type, the, the skull. So, mm, it's a, the, 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 the argument is more deep and more complicated than just the shape of the eyes. But, yes. Uh, we can make one life just as talking about expression, I think. Um, now, again, I just have a follow-up question based on that. You know, I, again, I, I clearly, um, you know, have not looked at the boxes I as closely as you have. Uh, so uh, if my question is uh, not, uh, is, is very basic. Excuse my ignorance on that one. Uh, <clears throat> the shape of the eye to me is the same for any boxer. Uh, you know, the eye shape uh, inside the eye shape is the same. It's not different for a European boxer. But you're right. In terms of the placement of the eye, the skull, placement of the eye in the skull is decides. Uh, you know how the expression looks. But my question is more about uh, is is more about the the leather, the face leather, the face leather uh, between the American boxer and the European boxer. Now, is the difference in the eye shape contributed uh, more because of the shape of the of the face leather? Because the face leather of an American boxer is much more tighter versus the European boxer, which is of course has got a lot yeah, more. Right on. So, would you say that would be a, it would be a fair assessment to say that is an important contributor for the eye shape? Yes. yes. Uh, you're talking about wrinkling, right? Right. Okay, so the wrinkling uh, in part gets uh, uh, more evident as you shorten the head. The shorter the head, the more uh, developed wrinkles you, you will find. Um, obviously, the, the eyeball itself, it's, it's the shape of a globe, no matter what uh, dog you're talking about. When we discuss, when we address eye shape, we are talking about the consequence of the opening of the lower and upper eyelid and the shape that you see. That's how much of the, the eye that you see. So yeah, the wrinkling, uh, I think uh, European dogs by photos and the, the few uh, chances I had to, to see them. Uh, European boxes have more wrinkles. European boxes have much shorter muzzles yes. and broader back skulls. So all this uh, ingredients uh, result in a different eye shape with more frontal, maybe more circular, and maybe with a droopiness and an ectropium that um, it's less common in America. Not that we don't see it, we see less of. Yes, uh, not more because Dan uh, Ripley, what I uh, what I, I wanted the Ripley, so I agree with him. It's one of our big problem. This. Uh, I want to actually, gentlemen, I want to move into um, move into the head in more detail. Um, you know, I, it's not uncommon for boxes. Boxes are not only good family pets, but they also termed as uh, dogs that snore. Um, the, the dogs that actually, um, you know, make us make us noise when uh, they actually, um, you know. You know when they actually they pant or you know that's what was that could basically be because of the positioning of the head you know it's a brach brachycephalic breed uh, and with that comes certain issues with that my question to you is actually about the uh, stenotic nares stenotic nares which is considered to be a uh, brachycephalic syndrome uh, found in boxes what do you feel some of the disadvantages of uh, this particular stenotic nares with boxes, it's uh, for us. For us, it's a very big problem. I think um, it's a problem for for more uh, European boxer than um, American boxer. 
uh, it's a consequence of uh, too much skin in the breed. It's very, very simple to, to bulldog type. So uh, not too much, too much to say. It's a, a real problem today in Europe. We have too much skin and do have too much skin. It's not relative to uh, morphology, to uh, exterior uh, look, but also uh, interior look. Because if we have a lot of skin, we have a lot of skin also inside in the nose. And uh, this makes a lot of, a lot of problems. So it's one very big problem in Europe, this. And uh, the only way to solve the problem is uh, come back to have right proportion of the head and dry dog about skin. So it's very simple. This is one very big problem. Um, I would address that in a little more blanket uh, uh, way, not just in Arignaires, but in general. Um, we as breeders uh, sometimes deviate into details. We focus so much into details that we forget um, the big picture. Remember, we are in a society right now where in America there's a big push from animal rights extremists. Uh, I know the same happens to some extent in Europe, and I know that uh, uh, especially the BBC in England have all these uh, uh, shows, uh, sens sensationalistic shows, to uncover the, the dark secret of breeding dogs and things like that. We bring upon ourselves a bad reputation by overlooking health. Uh, I always say that uh, breeding dogs relies on, on a tripod, uh, uh, all three ingredients equally essential, which is confirmation, temperament, and health. You cannot fall into the trap of overlooking health because a dog looks pretty. You cannot, uh, uh, pretty I put in quotations, uh, you cannot overlook temperament and, and you cannot breed for health only and forget breed type. But we walk a very fine line we are here to preserve a breed. We are. We got to be very careful not to allow ourselves to to derail and and go the opposite crazy where we don't care about health. We just want this beauty or we want this performance. And you know, families are buying dogs, and in America, many of them are dying at four, five, six years of age from heart issues, or at eight years of age they can't walk because they have spine issues, and. Uh, likewise, many other uh, health problems. Let's not forget the society we live in uh, nowadays and do not allow ourselves to fall into the trap of overlooking or, or antagonizing what I believe is common sense. You gotta have a healthy dog. You gotta have a balanced minded dog. You gotta have a typey dog, all the three of them. Totally agree. Like I said all the time, there is no one priority. The priority is make one correct boxer with health, with character, and that respect the standard. There is no one more important thing. All three are at the same level for me too. Um, would it be fair, uh, Dan and Marcello, based on, <coughs> sorry, I apologize, based on what you said, uh, that the root cause of, uh, the root cause of, uh, you know, the biggest, you know, reason why boxes die young, which is the heart. Uh, the root cause of this lies with with the head or with the structure of the head. Can is that a, is on a broad stroke? Would that would you agree with that statement? Are you correlating the shape of the head with heart conditions? Uh, the shape of the head and the and the difficulties that the dog faces, like for example, the breathing difficulties that the dog yes. faces. Uh, well, it's a direct and the obesity related factors, uh, the lazy dog syndrome. These are all the things that eventually lead to, uh, to a heart which is not good. Um, I can correlate the shape of the head with the hardships in, in breathing, in, in the hardships of um, performance and temper regulation, regula regulating, sorry, regulating temperature, body temperature. In America, Two heart conditions that are really, really prevalent. One is subortic stenosis that has to be with the deviation on the shape and the flexibility of the, the valve and the areas are surrounding the, the valves in the heart, uh, especially a subortic area. Or um, 
there's a genetic mutation that makes uh, that's ARVC where the the heart muscle for some unknown reason actually somewhat known reason uh, becomes uh, replaced with fatty tissue and and you lose the the performance of the heart so those are genetic traits SAS probably polygenic ARVC um, there are several different uh, uh, genes that cause that a ARVC situation. Uh, most of those genes have been mapped and are known, and there is uh, genetic testing for that. I would not correlate that to the shape of the head. I would correlate that to uh, an unfortunate uh, uh, lethal mutation, and most importantly, um, breeders who choose to overlook that and pretend that the health checks are uh, don't apply if your dog is beautiful or I don't believe in the test or so many other excuses not to do what is right. And I'm not advocating uh, eliminating every single dog that has a mutation. I'm not saying that uh, from this point forward, if you have a, a, a known disease, <clears throat> your dog is out. What I'm saying is that you have to add the, the ingredient of time and gradually breed out the known lethal mutations from the gene pool. I don't know how much of that is done in Europe as far as genetic testing. There is plenty of genetic testing available in America for American breeders. I wish American breeders would take more advantage of, of these scientific advances. I can, uh, I can confirm, uh, confirm, the, confirm this because uh, um, I speak about Italy, eh? about speak about Italy because uh, I take part of the first study of cardiology, cardiology problem in the Boxer Club uh, since uh, 30 years ago, and they we start uh, officially 20 years ago to uh, check uh, uh, officially the heart problem in the Boxer with uh, stenosis about uh, um, uh, double of, of stenosis, and uh, we can't correlate. Uh, the uh, head, uh, the morphology of the head with the heart problem because the um, in 20 years of test uh, we we get getting better and better with the result. We pass from 25 percent of problem, then uh, less than 10 percent in 20 years, and uh, uh, there is no correlation because. Uh, the, the morphology uh, of boxer are more bad about this, so there is no correlation. We we can confirm this uh, since now. In the future, we don't know, but since now there is no correlation because uh, uh, even the the bad situation of the breed uh, about morphology, we improve the 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 health uh, condition of the breed in Italy. Example. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, now, I want to actually discuss the topic of temperament. Um, temperament, which is uh, quite a bit of deviation, of course. You know, in the pictures, you don't see the temperament. But maybe some of in some of the videos that you see uh, of dogs that are presented in the European shows versus the dogs presented in the American shows, it's totally different. Uh, now, uh, I've also heard that uh, European dogs possess a lot more prey drive than the American dogs. American dogs possess a lot, lot less prey drive. But I also know that the the breed, uh, you know, is 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 actually uh, has a lot of rescues as well. Historically speaking, there's a lot of dogs that actually land up in rescue because they know they you know they, the people that actually got the dog did not know what was the demands of the dog. Uh, now, is the temperament, American temperament, has it been bred down? And has European temperament, boxers temperament, stayed close to the standard? How do you associate, uh, how do you, how do you, what is your reaction to that statement? The American boxer temperament has been bred down. European boxer temperament has stayed close to the original standard. And in terms of this uh, statement, how do you associate the temperament to the breed popularity in Europe and in America. If, let's say, for example, if a European, if somebody in America wanted to breed a European type dog or a European dog in, or introduce that dog into their program, would they have a disadvantage because of the number of, because of the type of temperament that the dogs are being used to? 
And the same thing in Europe, if you introduced an American dog because of the temperament, would you have disadvantages in in actually showcasing a dog? You want to start? I can, I can start. <clears throat> So, uh, about the temperament, um, I'm not the fan of the, the temperament, you know, because uh, like uh, uh, all the German uh, breeder and judge and trainer uh, teach us, the temperament is not the right characteristic of the boxer. Uh, I mean, I mean that the temperament is one part of the behavior of the boxer. Okay, but uh, mm, the the most important characteristic of the boxer is the strongness in the brain, the balanced in every situation. The um, Otto Donner, Otto Donner, a very important uh, and uh, old uh, breeder and judge from Germany, uh, teach us uh, like this: the, bo the boxer is one dog that think. This is one important rule that. Uh, uh, from Germany uh, he teach uh, to us boxer uh, is one dog that think so uh, the boxer is not one dog that uh, must have too much fast reaction so the medium temperament the medium temperament in the boxer is always the um, uh, the right solution because uh, uh, it's one dog that stay in the family before uh, to be a training dog, uh, the boxer he, is a protector of the family. And uh, like protector of the family, uh, must be very equilibrated in the brain, must be think about his reaction. Because just an, uh, an example, uh, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, there is a legend that the boxer is the dog uh, for, the, for the child, for the baby, no? because it's very sure dog, uh, very equilibrated dog, but just be, not because uh, of the temperament, because of the very strong brain, because the dog can uh, make evaluation of every situation and think what is the right reaction. If the temperament is too much height, the dog has no time for evaluation the situation, evaluate the, situa the, the situation. So, uh, I think uh, in the, the, we have not too much problem of temperament uh, in um, in Europe. For sure, uh, we are very focused in the test for so the 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 the, 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 pry, uh, the, the, the pry is one important thing in European boxers, no? Um, probably more than uh, American boxer, but. Uh, I think uh, there is no um, correlation with uh, the temperament. Medium temperament, uh, for my opinion, is the, the, the right way. For sure, for sure, if uh, the, the quality are too much height, too much height, there are some problems in family because maybe, maybe not all family are able to manage one, uh, um, like to say, um, hyperactive dog, no? So this is one, uh, another problem. So because of this, we are looking for medium temperament. Medium temperament, temperament is the, always the right uh, way for the boxer because German uh, breeder uh, teach us in this. Mm, it's very, it's very important point uh, for me for my um, uh, for my story because uh, I learned by by German uh, German school in training and in breeding about this. Uh, so it's very important point for me is um, <clears throat> I think that this is uh, one of the parameters where uh, some of the American breeders got a little lost okay. and overlooked um, I do worry about the temperament of the American boxer I think the level uh, and the frequency of uh, shy dogs in American gene pool is much higher than it should be um, having said that, there are several, several excellent dogs with excellent temperaments in, in America. Um, I think, you know, when I was uh, preparing for this uh, um, debate, I went back and read a little bit of Ross Dogman's book, My Life with Boxers. And um, 
she describes how boxers are how good boxers are with as family dogs how good they are with children how loyal they are to their owner at the same time that they're very good at um all this other high activity things like uh, uh, protection and, and attack and all this other uh, um, things. I guess what Marcella said is 100% right. The correct temperament of the boxer is a balanced one. Is one that the dog is definitely a thinker where he can uh, see the situation and evaluate if there's a threat like uh, uh, they're coming to the house or there is no threat, like you have a, a family with children and one of the kid's friends are just opening the door and coming in. That's not a threat, that not, should not result in, in an attack. And boxers can and should be very good at that. The balanced mind, American breeders need to pay more attention to this. It doesn't matter how beautiful the dog is, if he's shy, if the offspring is shy, uh, you want that bred out of the gene. That is a hallmark of the breed, and we should not overlook it because it looks pretty in a picture, like you said. Want to say one thing more uh, from Germany? From Germany, they teach us. Uh, I mean, the boxer is artificial breed, very artificial breed, no? And uh, they teach us uh, to with a, a, an example. Uh, please think uh, the 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 mind of the boxer like a box with uh, the space, uh, relative space for the temperament, for the strongness, for the other um, quality. Um, if uh, one quality, one characteristic take more space in this box, we lost space for other characteristic. So if the temperament is too much height, uh, we lost equilibrium, we lost strongness, uh, we lost other things because we must consider all characteristics in one definite box. So I think it's a good, good example for understand uh, how could be big problem uh, to have excess of temperament or some other problem. They teach us also that uh, the too much temperament in the boxer uh, transform the situation in problem of nerves. Uh, with nervosism and is the most bad uh, problem in the boxer when the boxer is is nervous it's one problem because it's no characteristic of the boxer boxer must be balanced in everything and not nervous can't be uh, can't have a nervous reaction in the family it's not possible this it's not the boxer like, I agree with that just one, uh, last, uh, one more thing. Uh, uh, okay, in Europe they say the boxer is the dog for the child. It's not a very exactly the boxer. The boxer is uh, uh, the, the 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 dog that uh, can survive uh, at the child. Uh, we we joke about this because. Uh, the child, the baby, make everything to the dog, and the dog accept everything because it's very strong in the mind. So maybe it's more correct to say that survive at, at, the, at the torture of the child. Yep. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, gentlemen, both of you, um, like I stated at the beginning, um, are legend in my eyes. Um, now you also mentor uh, a lot of people. People come up to you for asking for suggestions for advice. Uh, now, in the process, I want to understand your thought process uh, in terms of prioritizing the things that I'm going to tell you. Uh, could you list your preference in the order of importance? And I'm going to list a few things which I think uh, are important. Um, I'm going to list uh, breed type. Uh, long, long, longevity, uh, temperament, um, confirmation, and fertility. So these five factors are what I'm listing. Um, out of these five factors, what? How would you rate this uh, in the terms of order of importance? Would you put one behind the other? And if it is so, what is your thought? Why would you do that? So that's my question. I'm going to put that up on the screen. The five factors that I have stated: breed type, longevity temperament, confirmation, 
and fertility. How would you say this? Um, I'll start. Did you ever watch uh, either on, on TV or on, on a circus that, that number where there's a guy with sticks and plates spinning and he keeps all the plates spinning at the same time? That's what we do. So breed type, longevity, temperament, confirmation, and ultimately fertility. If you don't have fertility, that's the end of, of your uh, breeding program. Uh, I don't think you can favor one over the other. They're all intertwined. You just keep those plates spinning at the same time. Don't let, don't drop any of them. And that's that's how I see it. Uh, you you cannot, you should not favor one at the expense of the other because that's how it always goes. Oh, I love the breed type. I love the look and and whatever. And yeah, but the dog died at two years of age. What's the the good that you've done? You've done nothing. You preserve nothing. Uh, so everything How about that. I want it all. Okay. Sounds good. I'm very fast. Copy and paste. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Good. Um, and, and I, I want to actually share with you my thought process behind placing the question. Um, I have uh, heard. Um, interviews. Uh, I've not interviewed anybody who said that, but I've heard interviews where they say they are a, a, a breeder who say, I would rather have a good looking dog that lives up to six years than an average looking dog that lives up to 10 years. I principally, I feel that's principally wrong. The thought process is wrong. And the same thing also with in terms of fertility, I've heard people say, you know, if I get two puppies and they're good, that's that's all I need. I would not want a litter of eight puppies. But again, you're going against the probability of success. If you could have eight puppies and your probability of having good puppies will increase because of the number of puppies that you would have in that litter. These are some of the questions that I don't understand. But again, this is a layman question asking uh, folks that have been that have spent way longer time than in the breed than I have. So that's my thought process behind asking you this question. My answer to that. Why, why would you settle for less than than you deserve? Why right. would you settle for less than the breed deserves? Yeah, you don't want to look at an ugly dog forever. You don't want to. You you shouldn't want to look for a beautiful dog for just two years. How about look at a beautiful dog for a, a good 15, 16 years, right. and a fertile dog, and 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 a balanced-minded dog, and yeah. Everything. How about that? That's a good measure of what I want. Wonderful. Thank you, Dominic. <clears throat> uh, because uh, because uh, when, uh, like a breeder and a lover of the boxer, when uh, when we have uh, one boxer in a whole hand, uh, we want uh, uh, we look uh, the, the future in our boxer, and the future the, the future uh, all future with this boxer must be a healthy future. A beauty future and uh, with uh, right character because we want to build something with this dog so must be perfect in everything this is where, what we should be looking for okay wonderful uh, now I, I actually I, I think you have seen um, you know in the years that you have been with the breed you have seen numerous examples of uh, you know dogs that uh, represented the breed standard in terms of type. Um, you've also seen the dogs that have been big winners. Uh, that they're not good examples of the breed. Well, I'm not going to go into why those dogs won if they were not good examples of the breed. That's not within the scope of my question. Can I ask that each uh, that you list some of the weak weak points or overall things in your own styles that may be lacking or could be improved upon? Uh, you know, anybody could go first, Dan or Marcello. All right. Um, I can start if you don't mind. I, I will say this. It's very easy uh, to look at the rear angulation and see that's there, that's proper and so on. It takes a little more analytical um, evaluation to understand a front assembly. Uh, I would say front assemblies in America are a problem. We, we we like, oh, there's a trend where you have this, uh, what I call, 
and balanced but uh, pretty exaggerated dogs where you get the front uh, too straight, the rear too angulated, the top line too, too slanted. Uh, granted, those dogs can't move to save their lives, but we have a lot of bad fronts in America. We have a lot of narrow rib cages, which is the underlying uh, um, problem that uh, severely uh, affects the, the, uh, the front assembly. You have a, a slab sided dog, a dog with no spring of ribs, you'll never have the proper front angulation. Uh, the, the, the bones of the, the, the front angulation that, that determine the front angulation, they lay on the rib cage. So when you impair the shape of rib cage, you impair the, the, the shape of the front altogether. Uh, that's problem number one. Uh, some uh, of the bloodlines in America have very bad feet with not enough uh, arch toes and, and not enough padding. A part of it is the conformation of the foot itself. A part of it, in my understanding, is a consequence of, of insecure temperaments where they sweat through the, 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 their paws and they're always in that fight or flight situation. So they're ready to, to um, defend their lives one way or another. And these are very miserable dogs. They're not happy dogs. And that takes me to the major problem that I see in America right now, which is the shy and insecure temperaments. We have to pay more attention to that. Um, about me, um, I have uh, uh, I have one big problem. I mean, um, for my breeding politic, uh, I follow my way. Follow my way. What mean that uh, in uh, in many years? Uh, uh, I had to make a lot of sacrifice because uh, I not use uh, the dog that I liked in general, but uh, I use uh, the dog that uh, I needed. No, and uh, they was relative to my to my way. So uh, my uh, range of choice is very it's very little because of my my politic. No, and uh, um, for sure I have. I have many things to 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 correct or to preserve, uh, but uh, be, because I'm looking old style or I mean correct style, uh, start to be difficult to find example uh, dry dog without uh, without skin. Uh, I I'm in good uh, in comparison to other breed uh, breeder about this, but uh, I'm looking for all the time this. I'm looking for a wild bite because uh, it's one characteristic that you must preserve in every combination. Um, I try to find uh, the long neck. Uh, I have some dog with a good long neck, other with short neck. So I know what I'm looking for, but uh, it's difficult to find what I'm looking for. This is my problem. But also because uh, the, uh, the my range of choice uh, is uh, i decide that uh, it's more little because uh, i decide to follow my way because uh, i have my bloodline i have my personality my identity and i don't want uh, 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 love this for me it's important identity and uh, follow my way and uh, my bloodline so this is my problem I, I think your dogs don't agree with you, Marcello. <laughs> um, I actually want to do, um, I want to actually, I, I know that you are, you know, you are still, um, you know, you, you're very well informed about the development of the breed. You're very keen observers of the breed. Um, now, you know, you are sharing knowledge about the breed. And I'm sure when I approached you for, uh, this particular panel discussion uh, between, you know, meeting of minds between a, a American breeder and a European breeder. Uh, one of the questions I'm sure you would have guessed would have been, what do you think are some of the virtues that you see in the other style of boxes? Now, both of you have been very, uh, you know, have actually agreed upon on a lot of things and I'm surprised. Uh, I was actually thinking that I was going to have, I was going to be the officiator of a boxing bout. That's not the case. Uh, yeah. But since uh, you agree upon a few things, uh, more than a few things, could you could I actually ask for you to list some of the virtues that you see in the other style of boxes, Marcello in American style dogs and Dan in the European style dogs? 
I can start. I can start this, uh, this question. Uh, just, uh, just one thing before. If we, sorry, must start. If we consider, if we consider uh, American style and European style, no, I think uh, the, the right boxer is more close to uh, American style. This is my first consideration. And uh, uh, I think in this moment, uh, uh, European uh, European boxer uh, European boxer need more American than American need more uh, need uh, European European model. What I'm looking for in American style is uh, the elegance, the the dry dog without skin, the clean head, the rear the rear angulation, the back. Uh, very wonderful are very wonderful uh, the muscle are very evident no and uh, the proportion of the head we lost this we lost this so um, and uh, um, i think uh, um, also the underline because uh, um, uh, I prefer the uh, European chest uh, volume and everything, but uh, the underline sometimes in uh, Europe are not so so beautiful. So this is my this is what I want. I'm looking for. Um, I'll say this. Um, I think that the overall rib cages in in Europe uh, seem to be to some degree better than those found in America. Um, I, I want to start also by saying that my exposure, hands-on exposure to European boxers have a little bit to do with some of the do European dogs that were brought to America and some of the, and when I say European, I mean continental Europe, uh, and some of the continental Europe European bred dogs that I saw when I went to England a few years ago. Uh, England seems to always be fighting this uh, identity crisis where they lean this way and then they lean a little bit more the other way. And, and it's kind of hard to, to outline what is the English look. But while I was there, I got to see some European dogs and um, I do think, unfortunately, I know you're asking me to say the virtues of the European style dog. It's hard for me to go past the, the rib cage itself because I think their bone is excessive. As much as in some cases we, we lack bone, I don't think that the continental European dogs would necessarily be the cure for that. Um, I am very much disturbed by the extremely short heads and, and I'd be worried to, to, to bring that to the gene pool to, to some extent. Um, granted, you never breed for uh, one generation. You look several generations down the line when you're making your breeding choices. But uh, that, that's a component that, that I worry greatly. And just uh, as much I worry about the lack of balance that I see in continental Euro European dogs, where the rear is so much underdeveloped compared to the front. They, I, I hate to say it, but they remind me of a light bulb where you have all this big globe in the front and this tiny rear end that, that barely seems to, to follow the, the, the rest of the body. I know this is not the, the exact question that you asked me that I'm answering, but uh, I do need to highlight those things that, that I find important. So, so we stay true to type. Okay, wonderful. Um, so in, in light of what you heard Dan say, uh, Marcella, do you have anything to add? No, uh, please, uh, uh, repeat. Uh, sorry. No, no, no. Do you have anything to add to what Dan said? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, like uh, I said uh, in the start, uh, the, the, right, uh, the right type for me, it's more close to America than uh, uh, Europe now. So uh, that's all. We said all. Okay. Uh, I do want to add one thing. Again, uh, as I was preparing to to, to this uh, interview, I reread, um, went over two books that I find so important for every boxer breeder to have. One is My Life with Boxers, Frau Stockman, and the other is The Boxer by John Wagner. I don't know if this will uh, appear on, on the screen. I don't know how good you can see this. Let's see if I can. Yeah, we see. We see. Yes. Okay. So, 
to me, this drawing is very close to what the American boxer today is. This book was written in 1949. So this is only four years after World War II ended. This is when uh, those uh, top stud dogs were brought, the, the, the four crucial stud dogs were brought to America. So it goes back to the beginning of our uh, uh, conversation where this type, uh, uh, this uh, uh, look uh, is being uh, well preserved in America. We shouldn't stray for that. from that. I, I wish uh, there would be a more global view of what the breed was meant to be. You will find that in, in uh, many terriers, you'll find that in many gun dogs, uh, uh, but for some reason, uh, boxer people just seem to, to not see the, the breed the same way. Fair enough. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, my next question is going to be just this. Um, there are people in the States uh, that uh, that actually breed European styles. Our guest last week was one of them. Um, Rhonda Camp is one of the breeders who breeds uh, European styles with American styles. And I'm sure there are breeders in uh, in Europe who import dogs from America and breed them and introduce them in the breeding program. Uh, now, as a breed advocate that you are, what are your thoughts about blending styles? Do you feel that styles should be blended at all or they should actually just stay, you know, they should stay apart? What are your thoughts? I thought, okay. Um, I think, uh, let me um, start from a different breed. Let, let me talk a little bit about Akitas. Akitas are a breed that originally came from Japan. They have a very unique look. <clears throat> Actually in Japan, uh, those uh, breeds from Akitas to Shibas, they all look almost identical with the difference basically being the size. And then Americans imported Akitas and bred them and, and changed them profoundly to the point that's a different breed type. Uh, if I'm not wrong, FCI refers to them as American Akitas as a different breed. Uh, I would hate to see that happen in boxers. I would absolutely hate to see that. Um, I am not sure if the American boxer desperately needs a, a huge influence from European boxers. I, I, I do see advantage in some cases in some specific breedings i know of a few european bred bitches that would do very well uh with american stud dogs because of specific features of front assembly or temperament or what have you at the same time uh, they could benefit from uh, the strength of rear and tail set and other things that american dogs have and maybe those breedings will be uh, who knows, maybe they will be uh, uh, very important into uh, finding some middle ground. But I think the most important factor is if you go to a boxer national in America and you look at hundreds of dogs that are being shown, you'll find all the parts, all the ingredients that if put together in one dog would make the perfect boxer. Not in my eye, in the standard's eye as envisioned by uh, the original founders of the breed as, as it was described by the Munich silhouette and so on. So um, when you think of, of finding middle ground, it would be a compromise in breed type if you give up the accomplishments of American breeders. So in that sense, I would say no. The, the You can use European dogs to fix specific Confirmation features, and I want to draw a very clear distinction be between what's confirmation and what's breed type. Confirmation would be maybe a, a, a more spring of ribs, maybe it would be a, a little more angle, a little more this or that. But the breed type itself, as defined with the five parameters, character, silhouette, head, movement, and coat, we have that in America. So... I would be weary of the concept of giving up the preservation work that's been very well done in America in order to please a faction of breeders that in my view, severely deviated from breed type. We are not here to reinvent breed type, you're here to preserve it. And uh, I would like to see that happen worldwide, but not at the expense of what's been done in America. 
So, uh, I want to say, in uh, my ideal world, I'm in Arabia Saudita with uh, uh, 20 wife, uh, 10 billion of uh, dollars, uh, a lot of cars, uh, not war, uh, war working, uh, and uh, like uh, uh, this uh, stupid example, in my perfect world, I, I see a mix between uh, Euro and USA Boxer, perfect, but this will never happen because uh, are too much risk from both sides because uh, mm, like uh, said uh, just uh, one second before done the problem is not uh, evolve but preserve what we have because if we wrong some team something we lost more than what we can uh, take with this work for sure for sure uh, like i said before european boxer need american style more than uh, what American style need uh, from your uh, European uh, boxer. Uh, so mm, I think in the future I can't see the mix uh, between uh, the two style. Just uh, I can imagine some breeder that uh, are brave that take some risk and maybe they are lucky to have one right compromise and the people will use the result and the risk taken by another person. So uh, this is uh, to be real, I see just this in the future. So someone that uh, take this risk, if uh, he will be lucky, he will have good result, and people will uh, will take the 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 fruit of the of uh, this result. Uh, we must be realistic. Uh, it's more important uh, for sure preserve uh, the type when the type is more close to the standard. So um, the problem is not for, from America. The, the, the problem is from uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, um, I think, not I, I think, but I, I, I trust in this uh, world that uh, the, the, first, uh, the first step to solve one problem is admit that the problem there is. Okay? And uh, the, the problem in Europe is that the uh, judge and breeder don't admit that there is a problem. This is our big problem. Sorry, the, the, the game with the word, but this is our problem. Not admit that there is one big problem in the brain. So we should come back, uh, make step back, and uh, uh, make something to, to, to change. Not change, but come back to the right uh, uh, way to the standard. So, like I said, European people hate me, but this is what I think. Well, you, you, you're going to be a, you're going to be a more popular in America uh, today uh, because of you. Will uh, uh, will uh, we'll take me in here? He is a house. Gentlemen, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my next question is this. Uh, <clears throat> so I have, uh, you know, the way you know the my visual, uh, you know. Um, you know, uh, the way I visualize the European dog is a dog which is uh, leaning in the front, the dog which is actually, uh, you know, in a, you know, it's it's actually uh, on a, it's on a free stack, but it's actually uh, stacking facing another dog. That's the, that's, that's the dog I'm looking at. But the American dog, on the other hand, is, is, is nice, squared up, you know, has a nice arch of the neck, is presented silhouette, beautiful silhouettes, two different silhouettes is what I'm looking at it. The same dog, I've, and I've also seen some European dogs which look very European, and when they are on a European stack, and when they are stacked like an American style dog, the American style stack, the dogs look totally different. They don't look the same dog to me at all. They look very different. Now, my question with that premise is, do you see, looking at the future, let's say, for example, we want to develop a universal style boxer, a boxer which I can actually show in America, I can show in uh, Italy, uh, or I can show it anywhere in the world, which will be equally successful, uh, a unique style or a universal style. Do you see a place for a universal style, or do you think that's a healthy evolution of a boxer? But uh, sorry, when you talk about universal style, what 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 do you mean? Because for me, universal style is the, is the following the standard. So what Agreed. do you about universal standard, uh, universal style, because uh, uh, maybe the problem is 
maybe the problem is I speak about Europe. If uh, I go today with uh, one dog in the show, that is uh, the perfect the description of the standard, probably, probably uh, I have no so big such as like uh, with the other type, with uh, a classical European type, because uh, uh, the people now it's uh, focus on uh, on the the boxer of today, not uh, uh, what uh, should be. So I think it's a people problem because of habit about uh, what they are looking uh, all the time. So probably speak about universal uh, style. Uh, I'm not uh, to agree about universal style. I won't say standard style. Yeah, that's 100% agreed. Uh, unfortunately, in boxers, you cannot do, and, and we limit ourselves uh, because of it, you cannot do these breedings that, say, fox terrier breeders do. Right now, uh, I'm looking at a puppy, that uh, a fox terrier puppy, that has an American mother and a uh, father from Belgium, and it's just stunning. It's just stunning. The, the, the exchanges that breeders do in other breeds, uh, pointers, uh, um, several terriers, toy dogs, Pekingese, you name it. Uh, they can go back and forth. We are shortchanging ourselves. Um, I, 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 wish, I wish there was a way um, that maybe FCI would intervene and say, you know, we like the standards to follow the country of origin but somehow Germany lost its way and we have to go back to what it used to be. Uh, like the drawing I showed you from the book from 1949, that was the look. The, the Munich, Munich silhouette, that was the look. Um, by causing this, the formations and deviations from the breed type, uh, Europe is paying a, a, a serious price with uh, giving up breed type, but also giving up um, other things. Uh, uh, excess of, of uh, prey drive is, is uh, really not, not enough uh, to say, to justify that we'll give up all these other things. Uh, the, the, the nose issues, uh, health issues that you described and so on. I wish there was a way that FCI would be a little more um, would intervene more and say, you know what, guys, we need a reality check here. Uh, we need to go back to basics. Always go back to basics. Okay, wonderful. Uh, if, uh, uh, that's sorry, uh, just one consideration. Without considering the boxer, if we look just German Shepherd in, uh, in Europe, we see also in German Shepherd that they are uh, making a dog with more short nose. Okay, the boxer, the boxer, um, I can expect in the boxer this problem, but also in German Shepherd. So it's a general problem in many breed, in many breed. So it's uh, it's uh, the, the most important thing is uh, admit that there is one problem. If we admit this, we work for solve it. But Absolutely. if people it's close, don't want to admit uh, they are looking just for the result. There is no way. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I, I know, gentlemen, I had actually, um, you know, I, I know you both of you are passionate about, uh, you know, uh, or dispassionate about the elimination of whites uh, in the breeding program uh, or about the white boxes per se. Uh, and again, this panel discussion would not be complete if I did not actually ask you for your thoughts about white boxes and their influence as, uh, you know, uh, you know, the starting point of the breed, but them not being included in the breed. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, with, with the issues that we have in the breed that is, that exists right now, you know, the, the faults of the disadvantages that we have right now. Uh, do you think, do you think white boxes per se are a bigger uh, is 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 that is that a problem immediate thing that we should actually look at or that's something which can wait till we fix the problems because we have the gene pool in colored boxes um 
I'll jump into this one. All right, let's have a historic look about this. Uh, the white boxer is uh, a part of the origin of the breed. Many of the, the early um, ancestors of the breed were white. The, the number one mother of the breed, Meta van der Passage, was white. Uh, um, so it's part of the gene pool, number one. Uh, if you look at a picture of the Munich Boxer Club, uh, of a Munich Boxer Club meeting from the late uh, 1800s, you see all these gentlemen holding boxers and some of them were white. So white was not a problem in the breed when the breed was uh, first uh, uh, conceived. Um, a couple of decades later, with uh, World War One, and especially World War One, but also World War II, um, boxers were used as war dogs. And uh, for uh, that use, which is, let me highlight, that is not the original purpose of the breed. They were not bred to be war dogs. They just turn out to be very well adapted to do those kinds of jobs. The white dogs were very easily seen by the enemy and therefore they were considered a disqualification. <clears throat> That's the historic uh, um, ingredient of it. The way the white markings and the, the, the white box or the genetic of, of the, the white box or the way it works, you'll never get rid of them. If you like flashy dogs, you'll always have whites. The only way, so to speak, to eliminate white dogs is, is to breed only the plain, totally classic looking uh, um, coat color, which is not something that would be advisable because you're limiting the gene pool, you're, lim uh, you're diminishing your choices and so on. <coughs> so what, uh, excuse me. So what I have been advocating and trying to convince the American Boxer Club is uh, to allow the white boxer to be part of the breeding program in the sense that sometimes in the litter, the healthiest dog might be the white. I'm not saying it is because it's white, but it might be just by the odds of average. Uh, if you have a litter of uh, two flashy dogs, you're going to have 50% flashy, 25% plain, 25% white. So if one in four is white, the odds of uh, top uh, uh, the pick of the litter have uh, uh, be the white is 25%. So why eliminate that? when it comes to temperament, confirmation, and health, why eliminate the chance of bringing back whatever parameter you're straying from with the use of white? Um, the, like everything, breeding with whites is a tool. It's not the answer. It's a mean uh, to help get somewhere better. Um, because breeding with whites or, or because white dogs may have some intrinsic health issues, namely deafness. I would not encourage breeding whites to whites. I would not encourage breeding whites to, to fleshy dogs. But the breeding of a white dog to a plain dog, which would result in 100% fleshy dogs, if the white parent is a healthy dog, if a white parent is a dog with good temperament and, and uh, good conformation, that's a very desirable thing to do. I, I think that uh, bringing a stigma of, of uh, second class uh, uh, dog because of the coat color, uh, it's to our detriment. We should broaden the gene pool, allowing the whites to contribute whatever they have to contribute, if they have something to contribute. And it would be up to the breeder to decide whether they want to breed this dog to a plain counterpart or not. There's nothing unethical about that. On the contrary, it's, it's extremely ethical to produce more health, more type, and more temperament. Thank you, Dad. For my, for my opinion, uh, the problem is, uh, are the people. I mean, I mean that uh, I'm not, uh, I'm agree to put uh, the, the white boxer in the breeding, but with some rule. In Italy or in many other countries, we have no rule for the breeding. And uh, I think uh, uh, leave a breeder wild to use everything they want, that they want, uh, especially white boxer without rule, without control, without uh, any, any breeding plan. I think it's too much dangerous. If there are a rule 
to breeding without uh, with uh, good plan, um, good uh, good uh, good uh, solution for the breeding for, for the breeder. I'm totally agree. Uh, in one situation like Italy, where uh, there is a wild situation with the breeder, I'm scared about this. I'm scared because uh, there is no control, so they can make white with white uh, many time uh, or uh, uh, many other combinations without control, also without healthy control. So the problem is uh, are the rule. If there are a rule, uh, clear rule, I agree. If uh, there are not rule and the the the, the choice are wild, not. This is my opinion. Okay, wonderful. I actually am going to take a viewer's question here, uh, specifically on the topic of white boxers. Um, so the question is uh, is about whether they should be included in the confirmation ring. Dan, I know you spoke about including them in the breeding program. Do you have the same views about including them in the confirmation ring? Um, when I started this uh, uh, debate and, and pressuring the, the American Boxer Club to reconsider the code of ethics, uh, my main concern was that we have a high incidence of genetically uh, known um, diseases that the white boxer could help uh, drastically reduce. If you have a, a DM clear boxer that's white, I think he's more desirable than his little brother who might be similar in many other ways, but is not possibly DM clear. Either he's affected or at risk. Um, my idea was bringing the, the gene pool of the white boxer to increase the options of breeding for health. That was my number one uh, uh, goal. Uh, I do agree that um, dog shows at the essence of dog shows is selection of breeding stock. So if you're gonna be using a white dog in uh, breeding, you should have the right to have the dog evaluated by other judges to tell you how good in confirmation and temperament the dog is. Um, I don't oppose it. Uh, it's not my main goal. Um, I think that um, health testing would be the, the crucial parameter to bring in the white boxer into a mix uh, and also make sure that that breeding would also ha always happen with a plain uh, counterpart, not uh, white to white or white to flashy, but just a white to plain. So you will knowingly produce 100% um, flashy dogs that hopefully will have better health than the parents. Uh, I would just say, I don't oppose to showing them. Uh, uh, it's not my main uh, main goal, but I can see, I, I could make a point. I could make a case for showing them. I agree with, uh, with Dan. Of course, if uh, we must put the white boxer in the breeding, uh, we must test the, this boxer with uh, the beauty, with the health, with the uh, character test. And probably we must... Uh, um, take uh, another test maybe for a white dog because there are more tests to do for uh, for healthy for white dog so um, I think rule and test are necessary if uh, we want to try to put uh, white box in the, the breeding is are necessary without rule and test there is no way for me yeah I, I would just uh, um, I, I could mention several instances but um, there were times where somebody had this really beautiful flashy bitch and they wanted to breed the frozen semen of, of a dog that died 20, 30 years ago. It's a very desirable pedigree. Everything looks right and, and the breeding happened and it just so happened that there was one white puppy or two white puppies or whatever number. And to discard the, the, the preciousness of the gene pool because the puppy was white, it's, it's such a mistake. It's such a, a, a simple, simplistic uh, um, denial of, of the potential that you have in your hands. Um, it's just a shame. All around, it's a shame. Just be wise about it. Be informed about it. 
do your research, allow the, the parent club where in America we have a health and research committee with the American Boxer Club that's willing and able to give a guideline of what to do, what not to do, how you do it as far as health testing and use that to produce healthier boxers. That is the most ethical thing somebody can do. And I don't care if a code of ethics like the American Boxer Club code of ethics says it's wrong. Uh, no, the code of ethics is wrong. Remember, we as a society, we evolve, we learn things, we, we uh, start to understand the, the changes and the behaviors and the values. Uh, uh, many, many things that we thought were absolutely wrong and unethical to do maybe 50 or 80 years ago are not so today because we evolved, we understood there's science to back it. Don't let science be your enemy, embrace it. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take another viewer question, gentlemen. Um, so this is actually about the temperament uh, question that you both of you answered. Uh, the question I'm going to put up on the screen is, how do you interpret if a boxer is shy or if he's just unsure? Or should these labels be considered the same thing? Uh, depend, depend uh, of uh, of uh, it's subjective because uh, we must uh, consider what is the problem. Um, what is shy? What is unsure? Unsure? Uh, if uh, um, uh, we see that this problem uh, make uh, the dog uh, in a stress situation, it's a big problem. If the dog is just uh, uh, if not like to be too much open with people, I think it's not a problem. It's not a problem for uh, a protective dog uh, because uh, even I don't like the dog that jump uh, on the people all the time. Uh, but if this situation, to be shy, I'm sure, they, we see that make uh, stress in the dog is one problem. From what is this problem? Uh, maybe one problem in during the the first uh, month uh, of the age uh, from socialization from imprinting. Uh, uh, it's difficult to evaluate the situation because uh, uh, we must uh, uh, evaluate it, um, every single situation. Uh, but uh, what is shy on unsure? the level of, the, of, of this problem is important to know. Um, I would say that in America, uh, the way dog shows are, are held, it's very much uh, 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 um, fast process. Judges are given between two and three minutes to evaluate a dog. The European system allows for a longer time of evaluation. They write critiques and so on. And um, I'm not necessarily advocating for the use of critiques, but I, I am saying that the American system uh, to some extent allows to uh, a superficial evaluation of dogs. Um, the, the, the response that a dog has to when a judge approaches him or her, that will tell you a lot about uh, the way they respond, but sometimes it's, uh, a dog gets startled, a noise or, or a perfume or something gets the dog uh, to respond differently. But if you had the chance to evaluate them for a little longer to see how they interact with the judge, with the other dogs, with the, the, the whole situation in the ring, you'd have a better evaluation of temperament. Uh, remember, shyness is a um, deviation in temperament, is a, 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 a pattern of, of submission. Uh, and dogs have this whole grading of, of behaviors because they are pack animals. If you had a pack where every single dog was an alpha dog and the lead, leader of the pack, very quickly you'd have no pack. So you have to have these different kinds of, of uh, um, temperaments to adapt, adapt to the pack in the wild. But now we are no longer talking about the wild. We are talking about domestic animals that bring that gene pool uh, uh, in, uh, built in, in in their their codes in their DNA, but you're selecting for the more stable, less shy, more interactive dog. And 
in order to do that, it takes a little more time than just the, the two or three minutes. Um, as far as the question that was asked, shy and unsure. Unsure can be an expression of shyness. Unsure can be a, a expression of a, a, a different situation where the dog may take a couple of uh, moments to, to realize that this is not a threat or it is a threat and he may need to respond one way or the other. So it's not just one isolated case, but it's the whole uh, attitude and, and response to the environment that will give you an idea of what the true correct temperament of the dog is. Maybe, maybe in, in American uh, style judgment, uh, the handler can mask the problem. Absolutely, and they do. Yeah. Uh, in Europe, in Europe uh, no, because uh, uh, we go in the ring uh, all together. There is one uh, smart, uh, uh, fast view of the subject in the ring. After, judge uh, dog by dog. And after, again, judge judge all together and uh, maybe again uh, the judge uh, go to uh, to look uh, dog by dog so uh, take a lot of time in the ring and a lot of opportunity to test the dog right um <clears throat> gentlemen i actually have two last questions for you uh i i know that we could actually go on um i could go on for the next few hours but again i I'm want to starting <laughs> oh, you are okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so the question I have for you is: uh, having been a keen student and the observer of the breed, uh, what, according to you, uh, have been some of uh, the most influential dogs in the breed, uh, or who have impacted the breed? You know, have, who had the biggest impact on the styles of the breed in the last 20 years and why? Or you can actually increase that to maybe 30, 40 years. Um, you know, uh, the biggest impact in the breed. You know, it doesn't have to be the last 20 years. You want the, the names? You want the names? Uh, if you're comfortable, yes, please. It, it's, it's just your opinion, your perspective. And uh, I'm sure people are keen to get your perspective. Or, you know what, if you don't want to name the names, that's fine too. But I'll can... name names. Okay. As long okay. as the dogs are not currently being shown, I, I see no reason not to. Um, I, the first European dog that really caused uh, an impression of me on me, um, I may be uh, saying her name wrong and... I think the dog's name was Hot Chestnut, I believe. Erika Rizewski, is that correct? Hot um, uh, Chestnut. Right. Uh, that expression, early on, when I started looking at dogs, I thought that was quite an impressive dog. Uh, but I don't think the question was which dogs impressed me the most or caused the biggest impact on me, but on the American style. So... In America, you cannot talk about boxers and not mention Bangaway. Uh, Bangaway was the big game changer. He was the one who established and defined what the breed was meant to be. And not only that, he was able to pass that on to the next generations, being the top producing boxer of all time in this country. Um, he was a crucial dog. Without him, there wouldn't be the next few great ones that, that come to mind. Uh, like uh, Millen's Fashion Hint, who was a Canadian bred dog, but also a huge impact in the breed in, in so many ways. Uh, his son, uh, Shirkan Shadrak, also from Canada, stunning dog. A little more recently, uh, a dog called uh, Heldebrand's Jet Breaker was a great dog that caused a lot of, of impact. I uh, also would like to go to the other side of the pond and mention two dogs uh, in England, uh, Picasso, Sheffield's Picasso. Uh, he was at that time what I would have considered an international dog, a dog that could be winning on either side of, of uh, the Atlantic. Um, when I lived in Brazil, we had a Picasso daughter that was brought there and, and stunning bitch, Breton American dog produced beautifully the moderate balance uh, look. Uh, also, 
uh, in England um, a couple of decades ago, a bitch called Scotch Mist, uh, Ivor Ward Davis, Tim Hutchins, and, and uh, the Winnowoc people, they had this absolutely stunning bitch that could win, win either side of, of uh, the Atlantic. I am not sure about continental Europe for those two dogs in particular, but certainly uh, what I envision uh, as the, the true to type, uh, able to, to perform their function and hold together uh, the style that was so crucial to define this breed. About, about me, I want to say two things. Uh, for sure, one of all problems that uh, the influence uh, in Europe uh, are made by winning the show. Usually, uh, so um, this week uh, is one dog, uh, another week is another dog because it's a strange politic in the in Europe. People are looking just a win without consider if the winner is the right winner. But after this um, polemic consideration, uh, I want to say just uh, that uh, I don't want to talk about one dog or two dogs, but I want to talk about one uh, breeder. And uh, I think in the last 30 years in Europe, in all Europe and in many other parts of the world, um, the breeder del Colle dell'Infinito influenced a lot of work in Europe and in many parts of the world. Uh, he made it a lot of uh, boxer, more uh, close than standard than other, um, than other breeder, uh, because uh, uh, he was looking for original German silhouette uh, boxer. So um, I want to mention uh, his dog. Uh, the Code del Infinito breeder make uh, the difference uh, for a long time. Unfortunately, unfortunately um, in the last years, uh, in the last years, uh, um, the, view, the view of the boxer was changing in Europe and uh, uh, happened what uh, we was talking about uh, for two hours, but uh, for many years uh, he had uh, a lot of big influence, uh, and for most of the time, right influence. But uh, we know um, every time we have new generation, a new uh, way to think, a new boxer, new model, and uh, people are changing, are changing idea, they lost way and uh, happened what we have today but uh, i want just mention and they call an infinito breeder okay wonderful thank you so much uh my final question gentlemen is is going to be uh it's, it's, it's actually going to i'm sure it's going to make you uh it's it's, it's going to actually make you uh, uh it's going it's going to put you in in the shoes of the originators of the breed if you marcello and you dan were originators of the breed because you both read the standard you've studied the evolution of the breed you've actually read a lot of content about the breed so if you went back in time and you were one of the originators of the breed would you be satisfied with how the breed has evolved today <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can uh, repeat together <laughs> at the same time <laughs> Um, I, I will say this, I, I don't believe that I would have that capacity. I don't think I'm nowhere near um, the foresight and the, the visionaries. I'm nowhere near being one of those visionaries that develop the breed. I'm an admirer of them. I, I'm somebody who studies what um, they've done and what they envisioned and I try to interpret and preserve it to the best of my capacity. I would say that uh, I would just maybe remind you of the visit that Frau Stockman did in America when, when she came and judged that match show in Potomac Boxer Club. Had an entry of 100 plus puppies and she found bang away at four months of age. And she said, this is it. This is this is what I envisioned. This is what I wanted the breed to be, and um, I would say that to uh, to good extent, the American breeders managed to preserve that. So since they have 
I would say that the the founding fathers of the boxer breed in Munich way back over a century ago, if they came if they came to the boxer national, they would be very proud. I think uh, I think if uh, I go back in time with Dr. Brown and the uh, time machine uh, and uh, we go to meet uh, Frau Stockman and uh, I ask to Frau uh, where we go to Germany or to USA if she will happy to me we go to USA okay all right I think uh, I think on that but uh, we must make one consideration that is important about habit of the people probably if we go back in the time with one photo of european boxer today to the frau stockman they say oh this is not a boxer what is this okay but uh, if frau stockman could be live today maybe time by time step by step with the habit uh, she could be um, maybe uh, she could accept uh, the, the the boxer because of habit, uh, she see the, the this type all, every day, and maybe she take a bit to see this type. This is what happened in a lot of people. It is just an, an example. Eh? Uh, time by time, uh, people maybe uh, it's relaxed and uh, looking no, on the no, time. No, no. This uh, this model and say, ah, oh, this is the boxer, but just because it's habit to see this boxer, and they forgot what is. The, the 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 right uh, the right model so this is just an example but uh, i'm sure that if you will choice you say okay wonderful i think on that note gentlemen i want to actually thank you so much for your time uh and for sharing your unique perspective acquired over your many years in the breed you continue to uh, serve as uh, wonderful ambassadors of the breed and you continue in turn to share uh, your knowledge and in that way pass the torch on to newcomers. I'm very sure and confident that this interview is, which is going to soon be available on YouTube uh, for people to watch, is going to be a valuable resource for uh, people uh, who are tenured and people who are new to the breed to get uh, valuable perspectives. Because these questions that we spoke about today, some of the questions are very pertinent questions. I would like to think that all of my questions are great questions, but um, but I would actually, I think this would be questions that every person would have and could reference your perspectives, one from America and one from uh, Europe. And I think it will be really great and useful for them. Uh, before I finish the interview, I wanna get your parting thoughts uh, and, uh, and then we can finish. Um, I wanna say thank you. Thank you for inviting me, uh, for allowing me to be a part of this debate. Uh, I'm humbled. Uh, I thought you were an extremely classy and clever moderator. Uh, I think you put the most important questions to us and, and uh, they were formulated uh, uh, in a very clever way. Um, I wanna thank Marcello for his time, sharing his time uh, with us today. Um, I enjoyed greatly the conversation. Uh, I learned a lot from you today, and I hope I was able to, to give a, a small contribution uh, uh, with, with my thoughts. Uh, most of all, um, I think that we all owe a, a huge uh, gratitude to the breed itself, to, to boxers that uh, allowed all of us to be here together today talking about them and trying to preserve them. So all I have to say is to you both, thank you very, very much. For me too, for you and Dan, uh, very thank you. Uh, I was very, very proud to be here with uh, all of you. And uh, it's in this, uh, this uh, um, event are very important for the boxer world because uh, our mission is leave to the new generation a, a message, a, and share our experience. So um, what uh, you are doing is very important. And uh, maybe in future we will do again. And uh, uh, I want to just say sorry for my bad English because my English is very bad. And uh, one uh, very 
uh, important thing that I want to say, like uh, in the last interview, it's to boxer people, please follow your model. The the more to have in our in our mind one model, it's important. Our identity and our model, it's very important. Just this, and uh, you. Mm, are very uh, super uh, manager of interview the question was super very very smart and uh, uh, I think uh, very actual because uh, <laughs> it's uh, there are problem there are problem that uh, we are touch touch today and uh, I think uh, the argument uh, will take uh, more and more time in, in the future. So thank you again, guys. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Again, on that note, I would like to thank everybody for tuning in and thank you again, Dan and Marcello, for your time. Have yourself a wonderful day, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, bye-bye.